Okay, so the question is income versus substitution effect. What I want to do is I want to tie it back to the other lesson we did as well. So we'll see everything in the grand picture. So if we go back to our uh, lesson three, when we talked about income substitution effect first, we had a trade-off. And what was that trade-off in lesson three? Leisure. Right, labor versus leisure, right? So we had labor, which was our L, right, versus leisure. So that was our trade-off. And then there was a price change, right? There was a change in price. And what was that change in price? Wager. The real wage, right? Mm -hmm. My real wage, W. And then we said it's going to split this up into income versus substitution. So we went ahead and we looked at the real wage increasing. And so if the real wage goes up, we said two different effects are going to happen. And so the first thing that was going to happen was there's going to be some sort of substitution effect. In the substitution effect for the real wage, we said if the real wage goes up, we want to always, so the idea of substitution effect is you want to substitute into the relatively cheaper good. Right? And that's in everything in economics. If you're talking about 302 or whatever, into the substitution effect, you're going to substitute into the relatively cheaper good. If the wage goes up, so if my real wage goes up, that means the cost of leisure increases. So it's the opportunity cost. If I stay home now and I choose leisure, I don't work, it's costing me more. So therefore, right, working, right, which is my L, is relatively cheaper. So therefore, I increase my working hours. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Substitution effect. The other one is the income effect. The income effect always states that if my real income or my overall resources increase, I am then going to purchase more normal goods and less inferior goods. So if the real wage goes up, that can be pretty obvious to connect that to saying that my overall real income is going up. I have more resources as my real wage goes up. Right? Because of that, I want to make sure I have leisure more because leisure is a normal good, but labor, which is our L, is going to decrease because that's an inferior good. Plus we have a time constraint. If I spend more leisure, I have to do less labor. Therefore, we see L decreasing. Okay. If I look at these two things, we see that they are moving in opposite direction. Therefore, we have to look at if the wage changes, which one dominates. And so that's what we did. We talked about backward bending supply curve. At one point, maybe this does dominate. Usually, at the levels of real wages we're looking at, uh, we're going to see an upward sloping supply curve. And that's kind of how we designed that in lesson three. Okay. Flash forward to lesson five. And again, we have a trade-off. And what's the trade-off in this lesson? Consuming today or consuming tomorrow. Perfect. Current consumption versus future consumption. And what is my change in price in this model? Interest rate. Right. It's the real interest rate. R. The reason being is if I want to consume more today, I need to either A, save less, so I'm losing the opportunity of the real interest rate on my savings, or I need to borrow against my future income, and therefore I'm losing the real interest rate. So it's the price of current consumption. So we're going to look at the same thing. We're going to say the real interest rate goes up. We are going to have a substitution effect. And the substitution effect is going to be the same on both a borrower or a saver. So in this case, when we go over to the income effect, we're going to have to actually split it up into a longer tree of thought. The substitution effect is saying if the real interest rate goes up, which we kind of just talked about a little bit, it means the cost of C1 has gone up. Again, for two reasons, and you want to be able to explain that. One is if I am a borrower, if the real interest rate goes up, now it's going to cost me more. 
So therefore, the cost of C1's gone up. Even if I'm a saver, the real interest rate goes up, now it's the opportunity cost. It's still costing me more to consume because I could have put it into a bank account. Cost of C1 goes up, therefore, I'm gonna write it down, I substitute into the relatively cheaper option. So in this case, I'm going to substitute into future consumption. So I'm gonna substitute away from the more expensive option. So C1 is going to go down, C2 is going to go up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Income effect, we're gonna to have to do a little more work on income effect. The reason being is with the income effect, an increase, increase in the interest rate is going to change total resources for a borrower and a saver in opposite ways. So if I go ahead and I look at a borrower, remember all a borrower is is someone who consumes more in the current period than their current resources. And so if I'm a borrower, if the real interest rate goes up, they become worse off. Their lifetime resources decline because they're borrowing against their future income. And if they're a borrower, now their overall resources have declined. Their overall consumption bundles that are possible have declined because it's more expensive. So if that becomes worse off, that means they are worse off. The idea of the income effect says if our overall resources go up, I'm going to uh, if our income goes up, I consume more of normal goods and less of inferior goods, and vice versa. So they become worse off, so their real income goes down, so they're going to consume less of normal goods. C1 and C2 are both normal, so C1 goes down and C2 goes down. Okay, does that make sense? So that would be like a shift of the entire yeah, line. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with shifting the line, right? So change in interest rates, so we're going back to the IBL, a change in interest rate is a rotation around, okay. okay? I can show that up here in the corner if you want really quickly. So if this is C1 and C2, if this is my intertemporal budget line, let's say this is my IBL, and let's say this is my that no lending, no borrowing point we talked about, what would an increase in the interest rate do? It would make it steeper, and it's going to go through this line. We know that anyone in this area is a borrower, mm -hmm. and what do we notice about it? It On the borrowing okay. side, it has rotated inward, mm -hmm. because it's taking away all of these possibilities that they could have consumed. Why is that the case? Well, because the interest rates are higher, so now I can still borrow against my future income, but it's costing me more, so my maximum amount of consumption in the current period has declined. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I'm up here, I'm a saver, and what do we see? It's rotated out, because now as I save my money, I'm getting more resources, so I have more consumption bundles available, which is what we'll say on this side for the income effect for a saver. If the interest rate goes up, they become better off, right? They have more overall lifetime resources, so therefore C1's gonna go up and C2 is gonna go up. Now, of course, the question is going to ask about, okay, what's the overall effect? So if you're looking at C1, which is what we usually look at because we're gonna look at policy, we're gonna say the Fed increases interest rates or decreases interest rates, right? At this time, yesterday, President Trump called the Federal Reserve crazy, actually called them loco, <laughs> because they raise, they're raising short-term interest rates and claim that that's the reason why the stock sold off yesterday. Uh, I'm just going to leave that. <laughs> so we're usually looking at current consumption. So this is the same for borrowers and savers, and this one's going to be different. So in the first period consumption, there's going to be the exact same movement for borrowers. So it's going to move in the same direction. But for savers, it's going to move in opposite directions. So you have to do that same kind of analysis as we did in Lesson 3 of saying, okay, what's happening with it? Since um, C1 goes down for both the substitution and the income effect, would it just be whichever effect is on? 
Well, so if they're both going down, it doesn't matter which one dominates because they're moving in yeah. the same direction. You can think of this as a tug of war, but everyone's on one side. So it's definitely moving one direction. But for a saver, it does matter which one dominates. And that's just going to look at data. If we know the interest rate goes up and consumption for a saver goes down, then we know the substitution effect dominates because that's the one that's pointing down. But if interest rates go up and we actually see consumption increasing for a saver, then the income effect must have dominated.